And we are live. Welcome to the Chat GPT Fan Club show. Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. Don't Everyone worry. Here. <laughs> don't. Man, for I'm a wanna... moment, I was thinking I'm in the wrong stream yard. Yeah, I, know. Okay. I know. It's it's like, how do we end up here? Yeah. No, I, this is a much anticipated show. This the roots of this happened in the fall in some strange bar at at an hr tech show we were like was you know what? wasn't it it was literally yeah, we, we were yeah yeah we were in a speakeasy and we were like let's take this conversation and and somehow like get it to the public and will it work the only thing is we're all sober now so maybe it wasn't <laughs> such a good idea after all but anyhow this is our hr tech blowout show and i'm so pleased to have three people that are Amongst my go-to, I think we all have people in this industry that we trust for sanity checks and gut checks. Here's three of my top ones, Bonnie, Stacy, and Brian. They need no introduction. I'm not going to bother with one because that's not what we do here. But what we're going to do today, they, they've all done their homework. So this is going to be really cool. We're going to have a research reveal, and then we're going to get into uh, buzzwords that we can't stand and why. And then we're going to attempt to try to give HR leaders some actual advice they can use so that that's going to be the the real interesting challenge but anyway so as always your comments questions snarky observations are welcome hi meg <laughs> good to see meg in the chat i'm sure we're going to hear from her again before this is all said and done so looking well, forward to that can i already thank her for her leadership for being the first <laughs> to put in a oh, comment yeah. i mean her atomic leadership you know because yep. she is at the yep. center of commentary right now indeed indeed i'm sure she will have no shortage of opinions as as we go forward so uh yes and uh and i have a couple of hot topics from my inbox for for you all i'll see if i can stump you with those but I want to really want to start with with where we are in 2023. I think it's a really challenging time for HR leaders. That goes without saying. But what does the data show? So, all right, I'm just going to pick. Uh, let's start with Stacy. Stacy, <laughs> you, you you do a ton of research in this area. Yeah. Tell us, give us some some what you, what you've been learning. What are some of the surprises? That kind of thing. Yeah. So I'll talk a couple of things that I don't think are going to be big surprises because we did talk about it in the fall. But then I'll add some stuff that we've done in the analysis recently. So um, one of the things we definitely found was that, you know, we're in a moment where I think we're seeing payroll time management flip. You know, we were sort of the last five or six years, we've seen a lot of core HRMSs flip as far as people who had something in place and now they're sort of, they were replacing it. Um, we're, we're kind of, at least in our data, we're through that cycle for the most part, right? And now we're hitting payroll and time management systems. And, and I think there was this moment when I put that slide up at HR Tech where there was like, how many people are flipping their payroll? Because <laughs> it was like over 50% who were at least were kicking the tires and thinking about it. And when you got down to SMB organizations, those, and I say SMB in mid-market, right? Like under 5,000, that jumps to like 60%. And under 500, that jumps to like 65%. So it gets bigger as you go down market, which actually is usually the, the flip on that. Um, so I think the, the big wow is people are ready to make big moves with payroll. And I don't think they've been there for a long time. The thing that we've analyzed on top of that in the last couple of months that most people aren't seeing is that they're also taking money away from areas that I think we've we've thought for a long time were sort of not, we weren't going to lose money. So this experience platform space is starting to lose money. The um, performance management space, people are, are taking money away from it because they're trying to figure out where they're heading, right? Some of those areas that were for a long time kind of seen as, you know, um, worth sort of talking more about. I think they're worth it because they're they're going to have a lot of conversation, but money is leaving those areas, at least from what we're seeing in our data. I'd be interested to hear what everybody else has. So so that's our that's our big money shot. Like where's the money going? Where's it's it's coming from? So absolutely. I I, I told the panel I said if if we can resolve uh layoffs versus employee <laughs> experience by the end of the show, then I'll be really impressed. Yeah. Um uh, by the way, I, I want to let folks know that I have uh, a BS meter alert that I can show. So if I feel like we're getting out of control, that that, that is available to me. Stories for, for Brian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For Brian in particular may be a little concerned about that. Anyhow, uh, Bonnie, let's let's go to you. What kind of what kind of data are you seeing? Yeah, so I would echo um, Stacy's uh, you know sentiment data points around 
um, this area of, of payroll. So a lot of interest in, um, you know, switching payroll systems, which we has been latent in years past. I would say there is a uh, resurgence in, you know, looking at existing software and optimizing it. I think every company is, you know, budgets are really being looked at. And this idea of spending more on new software is less in vogue than it has been in years past. Every conversation is, is, you know, how is this project going to help me sell more? Or how is this project going to help me ensure that our company doesn't lose money or reduces risk, um, as opposed to, you know, buying something new. And so I think there is a demand for, um, you know, some consultant services around existing software. So we're seeing a lot more projects. How do you optimize what I already have or ensure that we're using and maximizing the investment in what we're, what we have in place right now, as opposed to buying new things. Brian. Your thoughts. So I'll echo the last thing Bonnie brought up on the um, buyers are looking pretty, you know, closely at these kind of expenditures. Am I picket fencing? Or can you hear me okay? Yeah, your uh, cam seems to be freezing a little, but the audio seems okay. Okay, sorry. I, everything's kind of going hinky up here. Uh, I think it was your PS meter uh, didn't know how to react with me talking. So um, anyway. Um, but back on, you know, yeah, they're tight. And in fact, I've had uh, one deal um, basically canceled in the middle of a selection because they're going to conserve capital and try and ride out a per perceived recession. I had another one where uh, the client basically put my proposal through, you know, like open heart surgery and wanted to only do just a small piece of things right now because they're still trying to get uh, – line up support from other executives in the company. So that's real. Um, the other thing, though, that's going on, and, and nobody really likes to talk about it at HR shows. Uh, I, I don't have a whole lot of love for a lot of speakers at HR shows because they always come up with these fluffy, no-content topics, you know, like um, engagement. It's not for just for weddings anymore. You know, <laughs> crap like that doesn't move the needle at all for my clients. And, uh, and in fact... I use this pyramid all the time that shows, starts off on the bottom at dysfunctional, moves up to functioning, then process excellent, then transformative or whatever at the top. And I ask clients to self-score themselves and tell me where they're at. And to this day, with all the progress that's being made with digitalization and everything else, a good 75% of them are still at the functioning level. I mean, yep. that it, the HR stuff's getting done, but it's like sausage making and legislation. You don't want to peek behind the curtain and see how it's actually happening. It's a pretty scary kind of situation. And so the, the shame in all of this is that I'm not sure with all the new tech coming out that we're having the right conversation in a lot of places. It's really about how are you actually even going to get to become process excellent is the first challenge right there. And I don't know that we're making a lot of headway there. Yeah, and Brian, to that to your point, you've been a little bit of a of a buzzkill at events asking vendors questions about payroll and finance integration. Yes. And this seem this seems like this is actually it's like, oh crap, Brian's gonna ask us about this again. Why why you been harping on that so much? It's still a major problem and and let's add to it, the other problem is we still don't have anything even close to what I'd call a global payroll solution. Uh, yes, we have a lot of providers that have a network of in-country providers that are part of a solution, if you will. But it's it's an ungainly uh, confederation kind of way of approaching uh, solutions. So, uh, yeah, I got a lot of frustrated clients who are looking for, they're looking for nirvana and they're having to settle for something really quite a bit less. And sorry, I'm, I'm Debbie Downer on this point, but, uh, you know, frankly, people want this stuff and the vendors, instead of responding to these very practical, realistic kind of issues, you know, we're still getting 
you know, we're, we're having somebody running off, you know, creating a um, an attaboy certificate application, you know, for, a, uh, you know, an employee engagement module. So can I ask questions? Am I allowed to, John? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we're kind of opening up now. So okay. you guys can start interrupting each other and ignoring me. Because is it even possible to get to a global payroll? That's the question, right? Like you, you, you said that we don't have a global payroll. And I, after sort of going through all this and looking at all the options, because country by country, everything's so different. Can you get a global payroll? Is, is it feasible, do you think? I think we could do a whole lot better job of actually pulling the basic information together that goes through some standard interface that then could deal with some of these other systems and then bring it back. But right now, we don't really have all uh, quite all the kind of timekeeping record reporting the integrations the interfaces we don't have a mechanism to keep it all working right there's a few vendors that can actually uh sit in between but uh either they their cost structure is tough or um it's hard for clients to make corrections and if there ever was an application that's just chock a block full of people you know correcting time reports or uh, correcting the expense entries, um, you know, after the payrolls already been run and and then how all that eventually gets fed to the general ledger. And then they got to go back in there and do brain surgery, trying to straighten out the journal entries that got all screwed up or corrupted when the time entry was changed kind of post facto. So uh, there, there's the administration around that, I think, is what needs to get addressed. I, I agree to your point, though. There's so much variability in payroll. Uh, we'll all be dead and buried. Well, I will be certainly before you guys, but uh, uh, before we ever get uh, this kind of thing fixed. I see Meg's bringing the atomic leadership. I, okay. say, I can't comment back to anybody on the comments, but I'm, I'm, I'm loving what we're getting there. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I expect the comment thread to heat, heat up. Uh, folks, please press the panelists with your HR hot button issues. Let's see if we can stump these folks. Tracy, nice to see you again. Look forward to seeing you in the video show chats this year. Please make your presence felt as usual. And um, can I can I just ask ask you all? Like, I was really struck after listening to your research because I went to some HR tech shows this fall and followed a lot of this stuff, and I didn't hear messaging that that lined up hardly at all with what you're talking about. Do you think part of that is just because the economy has shifted so much, and so? by the next round of HR shows, maybe there'll be a little more, or am I wrong there? Cause it, I, I'm kind of, feel like you're, you're hitting on a lot more practical stuff than I was hearing from the main stage and from the sessions. I, I think the, that the common collective has really shifted since the fall because of all of the mm -hmm. layoffs in tech. And I think that what was, you know, prepared and, you know, what we heard at some of the, the tech shows um, you know, was on the, the front end of some of these real economic, um, you know, things that hit the hit the fan in terms of of the layoffs and, um, you know, recession fears and, and things like that. I think that heated up in in October, November, December timeframe. Yeah. And I would have to I, I don't think it was um, I mean, you always have to think about events. You know, they're planned months in advance. People have got to get their topics in. They've got to be based off of what people did six months to a year beforehand, right? So if you think about where people were at when they were, what they were presenting on was was conversations that were taking place in the midst of the greatest talent um, gap we've had in over two centuries, right? So I mean, we, I, I think the the conversation has to be that, that we oftentimes um, think a little too much about sort of where we were at and not enough about where we're heading. And and when you've got to look at data, you've got to be thinking, I think, about you have to have a leg in both in, in both um, worlds because the historical part is going to help inform. But we oftentimes let that lead our conversations. Um, and that's what I saw a lot of this fall was that we were leading with what we had just gotten through um, instead of talking about what we look. It's happened. We're here. This is the market. Now, where are we going from here? Right. So, uh, to her credit, Stacy uh, conflated two things in one response. So, uh, <laughs> spoken like a great analyst, by the way. Um, so, I'm going to respond to both of the points. The one about um, have the tone and 
topics, I guess, for some of the, you know, shows has changed. I will tell you, the last show I was at about a week ago did not have a marching band. So apparently the tightening economy is having an effect on the user conferences. I see John's going to write that down. But anyway. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> was there at least like a piccolo player or something or no no we it, they just dispensed with they did have the uh, uh, you know the ubiquitous uh dj in the corner off on the far you know stage mm. right uh you can't escape that you know that's just there to make sure your eardrums are bleeding before the first speaker comes up on stage uh but the other thing you know stacy alluded to was uh this thing about we were coming off this deal of trying to find you know talent one of the toughest labor markets when we're out there uh i'm gonna probably call bs so go ahead and put the flashing meter up oh we're gonna go go for that all yeah. right woohoo so I'm, I'm gonna sell yes. i'm gonna self select on that because we have our first bs alert excellent <laughs> brian nice job so i think cool i am i'm appalled at um how little originality a lot of clients uh put into when it comes to figuring out uh, how they're going to find this talent. And I'll give you a good example. Uh, uh, corporate accounting organizations for decades, when they're looking for new people to bring into corporate accounting, what do they always insist? Everybody has to have like big four experience. That's it. Now, big four companies complain they can't get talent because they're running out of college graduates tap, but the, will they ever go look at corporate accounting people? And the answer is no. So you got two parties that change with the speed of the tectonic plates moving on the earth. And neither one of them has ever decided, maybe we need to rethink what we're looking for and what we're asking for when we put together like um, our requirements in and indeed, or whatever, and you know, the the idea of how they're searching for talent has not even entered the vocabulary in a lot of firms, and they're still trying to do the same old thing the same old way. And like that Einstein definition of insanity, uh, you know, they're surprised that they don't get the same results. That's a real problem. Is they don't they haven't changed the job description in thirty or forty or a hundred years. So of course, <laughs> if if it wasn't working for the last you know fifty years, we'll just keep trying and maybe we'll get a bite on it. In fact, I had a client just recently tell me they. They'll give an offer to just about any experienced hire that applies on their website. Now, think about that for a moment. And the last time I ever heard anything that ridiculous was a, an old client decades ago that was hiring people for a bakery they had. And I said, well, how do you know who you're going to hire out of all the applicants? And the guy said, swear to God, I put a mirror under their nose. And if it fogs up, we hire them. <laughs> so... I don't think tech's going to lead this generation to change for the, the kind of problem you brought up, Stacey. I think companies have to fundamentally change and not just tweak the process, figure out who you're hiring, why you're hiring, how you're going to go after them and everything else. Well, I did see it was the biggest gap in two centuries because I do believe that we were, we're in a hole that we've created ourselves, right? <laughs> so, yeah. I just pasted into the chat. I don't think this goes on LinkedIn, so you have to search it, but on if you want more of Brian Stylings on this topic. He published a bit of a scorcher on Diginomica called HR in 2023 Recruiting Where Creativity Goes to Die. So that's a nice upbeat title from Brian. So you can search that out. Um, Actually, guys, I get along marvelously with clients and we have a great rapport and everything else. I'm not the curmudgeon you're painting me out to be totally today here john but it was kind of interesting it, it yes, I, in I write those pieces yes I do. It, it was interesting though because one of the points you made in the piece is like why are you insisting on big four experience when the first couple of years in the big four you're basically doing photocopies and stuff like that like yeah. like what why is that experience so impressive um just just real quick on that topic uh tracy says she that payroll is hard and all the fire and attention is all about recruiting and candidate experience. And she follows up says because of the market, plus it is easier to make the experience stuff sexy than it is to make global payroll standardish. And that's probably true. But at the same time, I do think part of being a good enterprise professional is making uh, tough problems, the sexy problems and, and not giving in to it, you know, the, the sort of cushy topics all the time, but anyhow. And I think payroll is going to be more sexy in the coming months than we're giving it credit for. I, I know people are, are up at arms about what happening with on-demand payroll, but that earn wage access, I think is going to shift how we're thinking about payroll. 
not because it's the concept of getting paid immediately is that's got a whole other side effect, but to the issues that Brian mentioned about um, all of the, the red tape around fixing your system when something goes wrong with time management and time cards gets shortened and relieved by the fact that I can now do paychecks on demand without having to rerun a bunch of stuff and my audits get cleaned up. I would love to see from the audience if they've, those were the kind of comments we were hearing about why people were thinking this is the time to change payroll is that there's newer things out there now that we can do cooler things with. So. Absolutely. We got another comment from Tracy. That's going to like block everyone from the screen. Uh, she says she worked at one of those firms a long time ago. Uh, like the idea of kids out of school fighting with GPA to get that first great job it feeds the hierarchy, but they aren't ready for Gen Z. They aren't impressed by any of that. So interesting uh, gap there. Uh, and Meg is back. Earned wage access is a big opportunity with modern payrolls. You know, I, yep. was, just think, I was just thinking if Meg really wanted to have a blowout at the next uh, success factor, su success connect show, she could just have a keynote with the four of us up there talking smack for 30 uh, or 40 minutes and I'll probably have a, a get an SRO kind of uh, thing going. Only if the audience can do this. Then it might actually, actually work. So, okay. Um, so I want to give y'all a chance to vent a little bit of spleen here and the audience can do as well. Uh, let's have a bit of catharsis and go through, go through your most hated HR tech buzzwords. Who wants to start? Because you're already <laughs> painting me as the curmudgeon, I'll go ahead and start. Uh, I don't know if well, this, there's a term I hate. Quiet, oh. quiet quitting and i'm going to come up with something called noisy quitting and um and that's the, so what, you know, what's noisy quitting well this is the well it's kind of that take this job and shove it kind of attitude but you know what's going on right now and no one likes to talk about it, is all the people who are showing you their disgust with your firm and its pay policies by just packing up and walking out the door <laughs> and this study that um uh, Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta did that Bloomberg reported showed there's at least a three percentage point difference between the pay raises that job stayers got versus job switchers. The switchers are the smart money people on this uh, phenomenon right now. But yeah, forget the quiet quitting. That's the focus on the wrong deal. We need to talk about the noise of quitting because all you hear is that door slamming with people going in and out of it and, you know, leaving the company, creating that problem that Stacy talked about, which is where are we going to get this talent to replace all the other talent we've been running off and, you know, by the sackfuls. Anyway, we're, we're going to find them under the rocks that we're looking at, right? That we're not looking at. Um, I'm going to throw a softball to Bonnie because here's my big one that's driving me up the wall right now. And it's, and it's been around for a while, so it's not a new one. I think we need to rethink the term system integrators because I don't think they are actually doing the integration job. Okay, Stacey, you are going to, this is, we did not plan this at all. My buzzword that I hated was integration. So there, wow. that is my buzzword, and oh my goodness. we are we are on the same wavelength here. But how do you feel about seamless integration? Does that make make you even more excited? <laughs> yeah, seamless integration, which basically means that the two systems can um, be on the same uh, uh, browser, uh, right? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Exactly. We, we know that to find integration. If two companies have had a handshake, I'm integrated with them. Yeah. I mean, that is how the things are being defined at this point. The whole idea of standard integration, you can also also interchange that with seamless. Um, and it, yeah, it can mean anything. It could mean I just had dinner with the sales rep at another company. I'm integrated with them. It was mentioned. So I told on stage that about 25% of our comments mentioned nickel and dime or cost cutting or things were costing too much. We did account for integration being a problem, like in the, in the why my system doesn't meet my business needs. It was mentioned 250 times in our 5,000 plus comments. Like, like, I'm, I'm like, that's, that's a lot of times to mention one word that everybody's talking about, right? <laughs> Tracy says consultants that don't consult. Looks like she's about to go off on a tear. 
So, so when, when, when integration is like such a pain point, what, what in particular, like is, is slowing customers down here? What, what kind of roadblocks do they run into over this topic? You guys probably know better than I do. We just get the, we get the comments on it. I, Bonnie and Brian mm-hmm. see it up front, right? Uh, with How much time out. do we yeah, have here? The, um, the big pain point. With, yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, so what, what we see is integrations that are poorly defined. How does this actually work? What does this integration mean? Is it an interface? Is it uh, you know a file that's being passed before it, back and forth? Is it an API? Um, there, I mean the, the the world's your oyster when it comes to the term, and um, you know I think it's one of the, the the biggest disappointments during implementation is when you realize that integrations don't happen the way that you thought that they would, and um, you know and that's quite frankly that that's a thing that we hear over and over it's what we heard all of last year as probably the biggest um you know reason a, a you know an implementation um was was not satisfactory hallie's on fire here with her comments too <laughs> custom fields one-way apis <laughs> tracy too much lift and shift it is hard sometimes to get clients to understand the opportunity changes hard well, and Stacy started off hers by saying system integrators, and you know, and and you automatically assume mm-hmm. with the term in, system integrator that their specialty is integration, right? That's when the, the that's the way we refer to them, and that that actually isn't what they're doing in most cases. They're there to, you know, help define the blueprint and help with the digital transformation. The least of what they do is you know hooking systems together. So. I'll add a couple to that list too, which is the idealization of the API. That like, oh, we have APIs, so so you're all set. And then this peril of cloud software, right? The idealization of SaaS of like the problem with updates is when shit breaks, yeah. right? And and so you're updating your software and absorbing new functionality, but then then your integrations break, and that's not cool. Well, I'll admit it. Not only do I agree with what Bonnie and Stacey are saying, and y'all better write that down because that that comment doesn't come out of my mouth that Point. often, you know. <laughs> you know but uh, um, th- this thing about integration, what's really perplexed me is, uh, yeah, there are a lot of people that claim that. There are a lot of consultants who talk the big vision kind of thing, you know, about oh, we need to have a seamless, integrated, full digital foot fingerprint of everything going on, but they have no idea how it actually happens. And I had a CIO explain this stupidity that he runs into from these uh, alleged integrators. He was saying that what a lot of them don't understand is they grew up on smartphones and they think that if you build an app on a smartphone that magically somehow it just got integrated to some back-end system and they have no idea how that how that happens their concept of knowing you know is this a one-way or two-way integration is it real-time async synchronous what is it going to do and how do you translate something like off the smartphone how does it eventually get edited and um validated before it ever gets to post on some kind of uh, production database in some monster server. They have no idea about the plumbing. It would, and the corollary is hiring an integrator that doesn't have the plumbing skill. It's like hiring a uh, hiring a, an architect to necessarily do automotive repair. I mean, they may be highly skilled, but they don't know squat about what makes an internal you know combustion engine work. So I spend a lot of time on two ends of client projects. I help with the big stuff on where we're gonna go and and I'm over there just pushing them like crazy to get out of their comfort zone. And then I end up having to roll up my shirt sleeves and help them figure out how we're gonna do the plumbing, how we're, you know, what's going in the hot water lines, what's going in the cold water lines, all that kind of stuff. And how's it going to work? What's going to get connected? And I'm the only one I ever see put in like RFPs, like these are the specific integrations that we're going to need. And I know it drives clients nuts when I'm bucking. I'm like, no, I need to know all of the applications. I need to know all of the best of breed things. I need to know all of the mobile apps. 
And if you really want to see something wild, talk to somebody who does campus recruiting, because what you have to think about is there's an entire other ecosystem of, I call them the arms. Uh, it's what the, um, it's what the students have access to all of their databases. They've got the, you know, they talk to their tribe of people. They're using TikTok, Instagram, and all this other stuff. And HR departments have never even bothered to find out what do candidates really say about us on social media. And when it, you know, how many how many candidates are posting your interview questions or answers, the best answers to your interview stuff? And they don't know. They really don't know. So we've got an arms race of technology. And if you can't solve the internal problems with the um, integrations, I guarantee you have no clue how to deal with all the stuff that's happening outside of the firm and all the information that's being passed around by all these, you know, um, issues. Out there. And Tracy, you're a woman after my heart. I've liked all your comments and you're absolutely right. The campus stuff is absolutely no joke. Oh, her, her best though is there is no glitter and unicorn solution. Come on now. <laughs> yeah, we're going to get, we're going to get to that one in a sec. Meg, <laughs> Meg says integration well, the implications of scale, what works in a single record won't necessarily work at scale. And then Tracy's saying sometimes when clients don't understand that little changes can break in integration, they make changes, manage templates, and are surprised they just broke it. There is no glitter in unicorn solution. Oh, come on, Tracy. I thought I saw a unicorn in my email inbox just recently, which brings me to my uh, little contribution to our hype conversation. Some emails that I get, uh, I guess they just take a little piece of my soul and I can never get it back. And and the, the headline for this one that threw me into a tailspin, I'm going to read this subject header to you. Ready for this one? AI-based games foster inclusion, which undeniably improves employee retention. <laughs> Out. <laughs> so anyway... As far as unicorns and magic bullets are concerned, it looks like AI-based games are what's going to keep employees engaged and retained. So, so Brian, you wrote that column recently about how you engage employees. It's not about salary. You're so right. It's about AI games. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> well, although I will say... That if you tie that AI game to a really funny TikTok about your boss, it'll engage a lot of people. <laughs> to Brian's comment, <laughs> we're seeing. Yeah, yeah, help. exactly. <laughs> I just think it's so. I, I mean, what the? F I mean, so so like I understand the gamification concept, but why does it have to be AI games? Like, what what the hell? Talking about AI games. Speaking well, of AI ga games, Brian, I was expecting you to throw chat gpt for hr under the bus during this segment so am i preempting you a little bit uh i mean yeah i'd love to um, I i'd really love to push it but i gotta stay on that one stupid story you just brought up <laughs> okay moment. the uh i know i shared this with you but just because somebody can put all those buzzwords like your AI, you know, in recruiting and everything together into a sentence or a press release doesn't necessarily mean that anyone should give it any credence. Just like that story I shared with you, the marketing pitch of someone wanted to sell me backup software for my uh, Valentine's Day gift to my wife. Like why that anybody thinks that has anything to do with Valentine's Day. It's just clearly one of those things. Just because somebody could put it to two things together in a press release doesn't make it right. And I Wait, think you didn't try? Given backup software to your wife, I was hoping to hear you know, a report, you know, progress the, report on that. The only kind of carbon-based anything my wife would want would be in a diamond, uh, you know, not not a piece of uh, backup software for a laptop or whatever, you know. So no, not interested in that. Uh, not going there. Um, Chat GPT, one terribly, terribly overhyped kind of technology, and we're we're still riding the uphill hypotron, uh, you know, waiting to get to the, you know, finish its acceleration cycle. And then we're going to hit the, what is it? The trough of dis the, the yeah, valley the of despair. Yeah, it's coming, yeah. the trough of disillusionment. Yep. You know, we know that's coming. And then eventually we'll get to, what do they call that? The plateau of optimization. The I plateau think. of productivity. Yeah. Oh, productivity. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, and 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 the thing that just makes me cringe is opening the inbox in the morning. And I, because to your point, John, I know there's going to be some PR person who 
couldn't even spell chat GPT um, and now has decided it's going to be the anchor for every press release they want to send me. And uh, I, I just got to sit there, open up Outlook and just start hitting delete, 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 because this stuff is just not it's not ready for prime time. So so let me take a different take on the chat GPT conversation, because I think it's I agree with you that it's it's a lot of BS out there in the market. Feel free to put the BS up. But I've been watching some of the threads on the conversations and the most interesting comments are the people who are using it not for, yeah, <laughs> are not using it for what you're talking about, their PR and their press and to write their term paper and whatever else, but are using it as an aggregator of what's out in the market. Don't you dare be <laughs> laughing at my BS. <laughs> no, I'm <laughs> laughing at Meg Barris' comment. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, we need to touch you on oh, Yeah, yeah. It, it absolutely <laughs> will be in the in the trapezoid. trapezoid. Yep. I like yep. that very much. But yep. on a serious note, I do think that we're going to see this technology similar to, like, if we're trying to compare it to, like, iPhones and when they first came out was like, can you make a good phone call on it? It had nothing to do with making a good phone call on it. It was what that technology did underneath and to bring all the applications. I think it's going to be more of a search technology, more of an aggregator than it is this, this replacement of people writing. That's my, my take on it, but I'd, I'd love to th hear anybody else's comment on that. Well, so one of my um, friends from college is a prominently involved in this debate. His name's Gary Marcus. I've been spending some back channel time with him and I'm actually sort of becoming a freelance data scientist only so I can debunk some of this crap. And um, the, the you're, I don't think you're wrong about that. And in fact, enterprise search is somewhat of an interesting potential use case. Um, but I, I do disagree profoundly that, that it's, that it's a consumer search tool um, because of its inability to tell uh, truth from fiction. It do, it's dumb. It doesn't understand the difference. And so the data sets for consumer search are too big. I mean, look at the New York Times story today about this ridiculous two-hour conversation this reporter had with the Bing chatbot. They started questioning his marriage and stuff like that. It just doesn't know. It, it's just completely useless for, for, inter, for, for consumer search. I think for enterprise search, there may be some potential. Um, at the moment, ChatGPT do, doesn't have that information, so it has to evolve to the point where you can ingest company specific information, but I could actually see that maybe being somewhat useful. I think the the thing that I just would want to get across from my research is that this this notion that, oh, it's going to keep getting better and better, that's part of the del the, the collective delusion right now. This this is not going to keep getting better and better. This is essentially one form of, of deep learning that is about to hit a wall. It's already been trained on the whole internet. There's no more data to give it to make it any smarter than it is. It's a dumb bot. Hello. Um, but a as such, it's still a useful productivity tool in certain contexts. It's just that people are just think, oh, my God, in two years, what's it going to be if it's so amazing now? It's like, no, it's not going to get any better. And um, I mean, look, they're going to they're working on trying to fix some of the guardrails. But even that, like some of the stuff it spews out is incredibly full of hate and invective because, like I said, it's a dumb bot. It doesn't understand what it's saying. So, you know, whatever. I, I just I, I think the one good thing about this is that it, it forces us to bear down on what does this really mean? And I think that's that is a useful conversation as far as like we're going to have to work alongside machines. So let's figure out how they can actually help us. And I suspect in a few years time, there will be some nice HR use cases for this. So I'll, I'll I'm going to give um, a positive for chat GPT um, and I'll use you and I'll tell you how I'm using this that I found extremely beneficial. So I'm looking at tons of customer feedback that was written in text-based form. And I have to synthesize, you know, a thousand different various comments about a topic. So mm -hmm. I've actually used it where I've talked to chat GPT said, here's the comments that I need to synthesize. And, it, and I've read each one of those individually, but what that chat GPT did was take all of the themes that I didn't necessarily see through my read through it and very systematically put those together. And right. I think it can be very useful, especially, so I'm, I'm looking at it from, you know, what I do is I, I'm looking at customer feedback about implementations and enterprise software. 
However, if an HR person, they were able to train the tool, obviously in a closed loop private situation on employee feedback, all of a sudden it's able to interpret themes and, and things like that, that that a single HR person wouldn't be able to necessarily comb through themselves. So I think there's a sure. ton of application for especially employee feedback and engagement that is, is now possible. Yeah. And if you have a clean, it's all about the data set. If you have a clean, uh, valuable data set that you can feed into it, the synthesis abilities are quite good. And so at the moment, that use case isn't quite ready for prime time, but it will be. And I think that will be a useful enterprise use case. People who are using it for Google, I would just warn you that it gets basic biographies wrong. Like, so as long as you're happy, like with factually inaccurate results, then sure. But that, that doesn't easily get fixed because in the consumer context, it's dealing with this vast amount of data. And so that's part of the problem is that you have to be able to control the data set a little better if you want a better output from the tool. Um, the I'm, I'm all in favor of talking about it. I'm just a little frustrated by the the over-the-moon uh, conceptions of what, what it's capable of. That's my only problem. I think the privacy issues have to be addressed though before we dump all of our, our information into it, right? Yep. A because, million percent. Yeah, that get, tends to get very uh, quickly. Um, it, it's out there. There's. I read through some of the agreements and there's nothing in there that really um, um, controls where that data can go and what people can do with it. Indeed. But privacy is going to be a classic HR issue no matter what going forward, right? I mean, uh, all these employee listening tools, same kinds of stuff, work surveillance. We're in pretty uncharted territory in a lot of ways, right? I mean, chat GPT is just one aspect of that. Yeah. But if anyone is, is sees some interesting HR chat GPT use cases, by all means, let's put them in the chat and because we're about to shift gears to a more constructive part of the conversation where we try to make sense of what's good. This was intended to be more of a uh, cathartic e exercise and like <laughs> buzzwords to avoid. So, so that's just a little bit of why that reaction is a little bit strong on my part, but I've just kind of had it with the, uh, with the idealization because to me, and Brian, you wrote a good piece about this recently, but it's like so much of, I think our job is to, is to look behind this stuff with, with with that right combination of skepticism and intellectual curiosity, and I just that's that's the conversation that I want to have, and and I'm happy to have it around ChatGPT. I just don't want to have a conversation about like, oh my god, it's the most incredible thing. And come on. Um, Tracy says, I think that the layer of I watch a lot of sci-fi is skewed what it is. I like the idea of sifting through data, but I don't like the idea of a bot skimming resumes and see who moves forward. It's it's really interesting too because. Um, because Stacy, when I had you on my show a while back, I, th I thought you had a pretty balanced view about the use of AI for various kinds of recruitment and screening. You weren't like completely opposed to that in all cases. Um, obviously, that's a major issue of sort of AI and recruitment and such that goes well beyond chat GTP. But does anyone have any comments on, on where they'd like to, that technology to go or not go in, in HR? The only thing that I think, and, and you and I talked about this last time, but I think anytime you put AI in place, you have to have a control group in place as well. It's it, it, the, the thing I think we forget is that these we're experimenting with the data still, right? Like there's, there's no tried and true. And so anytime you're doing like a resume sort of sorting that kind of thing, right? Make sure you've got a human model that you're, that you're putting it through as well to see how those compare. That would be my big thing. Don't run away from it, as we said, but, but don't, let it own your process. I'd echo Stacy's comments. I'll, I'll probably be more brutal in, <laughs> you know, there is a predecessor technology. No one wants to use those three letter acronyms, the ATS, the applicant tracking system, which is supposed to be like scoring resumes. And every vendor tells me, oh, but we're doing more than keyword search. And then I find out all they're doing is keyword search. Um, and they, those systems throw out so many great people because they may not have described their, their job and roles and skills they had in the past using the same taxonomy that your company uses because your company is kind of a, you know, it's an entity of one. And I don't know that a, 
a bot is going to be, or an AI tool is necessarily going to be more accurate because it's based on kind of what did it train on. And if it trained on past applicants that a company has hired or brought in, it's going to replicate that bias against a new crop of resumes coming in the door. So I agree with Stacy. You definitely need to have a control group, not once, but probably like every month or two, you need to pull a bunch of resumes, you know, at random, run them through the tool. And at the same time, run them by your own recruiting staff and find out like, who did you like? And if the results don't match, there's a problem. Yeah. Unfortunately, most companies don't do any of that effort. They just accept the thing right out of the box. And then they can't, then they're back complaining. I can't find any qualified talent. Well, that's because your ATS threw it all in the garbage can, um, you know, before you ever even looked at it. I didn't wait. Yeah. Sorry for I actually point. got a I got a halfway decent email on this topic in my inbox, believe it or not. Um it's it says, Hi John, as you know, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission released its draft strategic enforcement plan in January, outlining its priorities through 2027, and it says the agency will prioritize investigations of potential discrimination stemming from the use of AI tools in recruitment, screening, hiring, promotion, and other employment decisions. It's the first time AI has been referenced in the enforcement plan. So that's kind of interesting, right? Like it's not regulatory yet, but it's starting to show up a little bit on the regulatory uh, you know, framework. And so I think that's a good wake-up call for HR people. That's, that's not the fun. only place... The regulations coming in, it's hitting all the video interviewing technologies and the uh, software related to that that analyzes, like, are you telling the truth or not, uh, you know, uh, and automatically scoring based on what it thinks the either truthfulness or the um, uh, ability of the job seeker to actually uh, prove that they have this skill. And, you know, so there's all this interpretation going on behind the scenes and automatically scoring of somebody based on a video interview. And that stuff's not got a lot of time or science behind it right now. So that's kind of a regulatory risk waiting to bite somebody unless you, you've got a bulletproof indemnification clause with the vendor to protect you in the event you get, you know, slapped with a problem, a yeah. fine, or have you. I'd be interested in knowing, Bonnie, because you work with a lot of the implementers and the integration uh, system integrators. Are they taking on these kind of systems as part of their implementation process? Or are they kind of hands off and only focusing on the enterprise core systems and letting? Because what I'm finding is that um, we've got these very sophisticated people who are doing implementations at our core level. And we don't have as sophisticated teams working on this kind of stuff that you're just talking about, Brian. I think everybody's talking about it, but I don't think that many of the consulting firms have the expertise to lend just yet. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's it's an area that, you know, is a very specific domain that yeah, I think the, the, the SIs would love to have a service around it and they have, you know, uh, folks who could who could implement that type of thing, but don't today. There's not a lot of people with that expertise um, out there today. It's expensive. Yeah. Well. So you're saying those three years I spent installing Tesseract in the early '90s don't count? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you could apply for some jobs and find out, Brian. I know you've done that in the past with with very mixed results. Uh, I'll never forget 2008. A guy, I got his resume to help on a client review candidates for a project, and he claimed in 2008 he claimed to have 15 years experience implementing uh, Workday, which is interesting since the company was only founded in 2005, three years earlier. <laughs> but you know, I, I'm just wondering would Chat GPT catch you know something like that? You know, mm. um, yeah, I would no. love to train Jet Chat GPT and critiquing a resume uh but anyway that's that's probably not that's an application that's one application too far meg's putting forth the diabolical concept of truthiness which i'm afraid we've probably already arrived at in our society over truth but anyhow truth truthiness scares me a little bit meg so i'm gonna keep my distance from that um well we don't have a whole lot of time left but what i what i really do want to do though is to try to shift gears a little bit into sort of uh you know, what, what you think HR leaders should, should be actioning, like where are the opportunities? It's, it's obviously a difficult play to stuff uh, right now, but wh where should we go from here in a constructive direction? 
constructive. Well, you're asking a lot of us today, John. It's Friday afternoon. <laughs> I know. I know. So I had a slide, and I don't know if it actually popped up or not. Did it, anything come up, guys? No? I don't know. Do you want to? You could try a screen share if you want. Does I, I did, but it, I don't know if it's popping up at all. Let me just Let me just try to see if I can help you out with that. I don't know if I'm getting... Chat GPT is probably preventing me from sharing this. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't see it okay, offhand. Well, Sorry, we should have rehearsed that. Uh, I've been trying, you know, behind the scenes. But anyway, so here's what's um, here's what's kind of I think interesting. Uh, you're looking ahead. Uh, I see that there have been about seven generations of HCM solutions on the market. Uh, you know, going all the way back, the first generation, those were all the batch proprietary kind of things. And all they did was just automate a, you know, a paper and manual kind of process. The fifth generation is where we had all the cloud stuff popping up. And, you know, and I even had an argument earlier this week with a CIO who still doesn't believe in multi-tenancy, if you can believe that. Okay, so uh, Luddites reign supreme still. Uh, they're still out there. Um, the sixth generation where has been what I would call the smart HCM deal. It's where we've got, we're trying to come up with uh, cool analytics, smart analytics. There's some big data driving some of the stuff and some predictive workflows and things like that. Predictive training um, uh, suggestions like, but it's all, it's all been around uh, getting smart using a lot of the data that was already in maybe an HCM, you know, solution to begin with. Stacy's got a cat walking behind her. Um, oh, my cat. Oh yeah. <laughs> he's, he's about to attack. <laughs> Well, what's happening right now is there's a seventh generation coming out, and I call it the rethought HR generation because this is where you're going to process automate the bejesus out of everything. Uh, you're going to have everything digital, and you're going to have AI everywhere. And, you know, if you show me a piece of paper or a spreadsheet or some SharePoint folder, or whatever, then I know you're not at the seventh generation yet. And one of the things that has to be there in the seventh generation is everything damn well better be integrated because we can't have these breaks and gaps where stuff falls off and then we got to go build a special schedule in, in uh, Excel and then we got to write a, a, um, another spreadsheet to make sure we can reconcile all the uh, data and entries and everything else. You know, there are companies that are stuck. They still haven't made it to the fifth generation around the cloud. There's a most of them still haven't finished out the sixth generation about creating a a smart kind of world with a lot of um, you know intelligence that is picking up out of the information. And I'm not sure we're quite ready yet for the seventh generation. I'm not even sure the vendors have built out everything that's required there. But that's where the market's moving. Yeah. Couple comments. Uh, Holly says, there's been a lot of HR tech innovation. I think HR leaders need a little time to synthesize and optimize before digesting more tech. And then Tracy's saying she talks process pain points and fixes. The more she speaks in plain language to HR leaders, the better. I'm detecting a pattern here. I'm, I'm going to give my senses actually more for the vendors because I think this, there's some work that the vendors need to do that we have left on the table. So I, I think actually all the feature functionality integrations, the vendors have actually got tools that will do that for the most part. I think I think we're right now in a process where consultants and advisors aren't aren't doing a lot of the work they need to do to, to, to tie the back ends together. So I think there's there's a bit of work there. But I do think where the vendors are falling down is they're not putting in place enough guidance for the people who maintain and manage these systems on a everyday basis. What we're seeing over and over again in our research is that um, we're seeing this constant almost cry for help from the people who are left after the, the implementers leave, right? That they can't figure out how to get the configurations right or how to get the integrations updated. Or And, and if we can get an end user to figure out how to go through a multi six level step performance management process with walkthroughs and videos and WYSIWYGs, whatever we can do, right? And we can't give the same time and energy to the HR support administration and managers to say, here's how you configure this so it works best for your company as we make updates, I think we're, we're, we're falling down on the job. And to me, that's the biggest thing right now from a practicality perspective is we need to do something for those 
HR, because because we all leave at the end of the day. We're we're consultants, right? I mean, let's be honest about who we are and what we do. We say, here, this is great. And we walk out the door and somebody's left at two in the morning trying to figure out how to get payroll run. And and there's not enough guidance on 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 that side of it, um, I think, to make this to make this keep going the way we're going. I would agree, Stacy, with what you just said and this idea of knowledge transfer, you know, after that, let's say year one of project and implementation, um, it's, you know, it's a, it's a big gap and we see churn on project teams and new folks that may have not been initially involved with the implementation now having to support an application with very poor documentation. And I think that turnover and knowledge transfer uh, and the documentation that goes along with it um, is really important. Um, I would say from my perspective, um, what's the advice for the year? Um, also, this would be going to um, the vendors and, and the service providers um, as well. And that would be, you know, sell what you have today and not this future promise of HR, I'm sorry, of, uh, of AI for HR, um, you know, chat GPT or whatever. I think it's the big buzzword. It'll get a lot of initial attention. It seems like that's what everybody's talking about. On the other hand, it's not necessarily real. And if you can't put it into practice um, as well as get it, you know, implemented, um, it's just a lot of noise. So let's stick with, you know, what's here today and, you know, get, you know, sell that, not what's coming in the future. Um, because, you know, so much of that is, is just vaporware anyways. If I could throw one quick one in. Yeah, sure, Brian. The other thing I think we got to watch out for is, uh, we got to look at this industry uh, in a new light because there's so much private equity that's moved into the HCM space. Mm -hmm. And those owners have a very different idea of direction where they want to take these companies. And all that has a tremendous impact on the existing customers and the customers to come. Uh, they've got, yeah, it's great that some of them can put a nice, tight financial discipline on companies, but they change executives all the time. Uh, they, they kind of put stress on my clients because the clients are always trying to figure out where we're going to go now. There's been another material change control or the PE firm sold it out. And there's also the the um, activist shareholders are agitating in mm -hmm. a couple of big companies too. So there's a bunch of stuff on the extern externality kind of wave front that I think has got to be looked at as well. And I just want to say that while I, I can be a little bit, rough on on vendors around like what i see it shows versus what i think is real one, one thing that that i really did like this fall is i saw an advance in employee listening frameworks and and this is one area where i think sometimes vendors may be a little ahead of customers but not necessarily in a bad way where where you know the ability to kind of take employee sentiment, take the pulse of your employees on a more regular basis and take action around that rather than this more static approach where once a year you might have a performance review or what have you like. I'm encouraged by some of those things. And I like what I heard from a couple of customers on that, though. I really want to do more due diligence on because I think it, it, it's a culture thing, right? Like even if the technology is there, it doesn't mean that it's easy to suddenly start listening to your employees, right? Because Ultimately, you're going to get called out if you're hypocritical in, in your policies, then then more frequent listening is just going to increase the disillusionment. But I'm encouraged that some of the tools for that are developing. And I, I press some questions on that as far as things like, well, what about a bad manager, for example? Because I know, Brian, you've brought that up a lot, and it's a really good question. Like, how do you get out from under a bad manager? And there's, some of these vendors have some pretty decent, interesting answers around how anonymized feedback can be incorporated and such to try to identify that a little more often. So I don't think it's a utopian situation with that, but I like those tools and I'm interested in how they can be implemented in the future. So that was one thing I took from my fall HR tech shows. Listening is definitely one of the things that we're, we're seeing people are interested in. It's different from the experience platform. It gets tied a lot to the experience platform, but I think it's a different dialogue. So it's, it's interesting yep. to see that you're seeing it too, John. I think there's potential there is all I'm saying, but I, I do think, I do think the tools in the wrong culture, the tools aren't going to work. They're not going to help at all. It's just going to accelerate the, the doom and gloom. 
rather than improve it. So we shall see. Uh, folks in the chat, we are just about going to wrap. So now's the time to get your final questions or shots in for <laughs> these lovely panelists. My cat's back there saying it's dinner time, John. He's very upset with yeah. me. Yeah. Open the door. Yeah. <laughs> I think you need to yeah. flash the BS meter up some more. Maybe yeah. that'll get the last comments coming in. Yeah, exactly. Well, I we, we can do it one more time if you missed it earlier. We do actually. And we are still in the red zone, oh, unfortunately. It's always over you. It's probably I know. more of it. Yeah. I, I have a couple limitations. That's not intentionally meant to tag Bonnie. It's just I have a limitation on on where that logo can uh, can land at this moment. So... Uh, so any any final thoughts from from the group here? Anything that we? Uh, oh, Tracy likes the BS meter. I've actually Tracy, I have a I have a different version of it that actually says Enterprise BS meter that I haven't uploaded yet, which is pretty cool. <laughs> um, thanks to the MVPs in the chat, y'all y'all were y'all were great today to really press the conversation. Um, any final thoughts? Things we didn't cover? Things you wanted to touch on? Well, for what it's worth, Meg gets an atomic leadership thanks from me just because she made me bust up laughing in the middle of this whole thing. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, I usually try to do do that to other people on their podcast or whatever. But uh, yeah, good job, Meg. Meg got a, cu a couple of good hits in there. I was very surprised that we didn't get any any armadillo stories or anything, Brian. So so I'm expecting him next time. All right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I get the sense Brian is not going to serve up an armadillo story on demand. I, I, Come I'm on, Brian. Right he's, no. you know, he's wait. He's wait. He's 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 thinking about it. He's got something in mind. <laughs> yeah, he it's it's cooking. <laughs> any uh, any 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 sneak previews of of coming uh, research or events we should be aware of? Any anything we should be tracking? Yeah. There's, um, I mean, who? W there are a couple events coming up, right? We got the the um, virtual HR tech conference that's coming up in a few weeks. Mm -hmm. So I think some of us are going to be attending some of that as analysts. Um, I know there's an Unleash event. I don't know how many people will be attending that. I, I don't think I'm going to be able to make that. Um, anybody else is going to be at the ADP meeting of the minds? I think there's some some people who I know uh, our uh, director of research is going to that. Where else are we can see each other. Well, I definitely run in some little bit different circles, but uh, I, I mean, I'll hit some of the same vendors you guys and always look forward to seeing y'all with the shows. But uh, I know I'm coming up off the top of my head. I got to go to one stream plan full. Um, I'm doing a deal in uh, with Soho and who else? I mean, it's amazing to me, depending on the PR person, they either think I'm a finance person or an HR person. So, uh, you know, I've got this schizophrenic uh, travel schedule in front of me. Bonnie, where are, you, where are we going to see you next? Um, I, I will likely be at the Meeting of the Minds. And um, my shows are, are really, you know, balanced out in the summer and fall. So, um, for sure, coming up. Well, if you see one of us at shows and you haven't met, don't hesitate to come up and introduce. Uh, I think we get smarter through these conversations. So thanks to all of you who participated. And I hope we lived up to your expectations from the from a bar, speakeasy bar in Vegas to live virtual stream. Thank you for allowing me to debut my BS meter. Nothing personal, but I did need to try it out. Thanks all. <laughs> Have a great night. Thanks, Thanks guys. Bye. Later. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye everybody.